Welcome to the History Makers 2020. 20 days of content around the history of our people uh, and 20 nights. Here, we're going to look at what is the legacy of the black lawyer in the United States? Uh, I'm David Wilkins. I'm the Lester Kissel Professor of Law here at Harvard Law School, and I'll be your moderator and guide for what is going to be a fantastic discussion. But we're going to begin with some footage unique to the History Makers archives of the history of black lawyers. So let's go to the video. One reason why I never looked for a job in a white firm is because of a conversation I had with William T. Coleman, who told me that he was interviewed by a law firm in New York City. And they told him they were willing to give him a job in their law office. But there was an important condition. He asked them, what is the condition? And they told him, you cannot come in contact with our clients. So I told Bill Coleman, that's a hell of a way to practice law. <laughs> practice law so you don't come in contact with clients. When I was uh, being considered for the Sixth Circuit, I was really concerned about it because I was chief judge of the Eastern District of Michigan here, and the first black chief judge here in, in, in the Eastern District of Michigan. And the lawyers, the black lawyers, and a lot of the white lawyers were saying, well, Damon, we need you here in Detroit as the chief judge of the court here, because at that time, the chief judge had a lot of authority in terms of selecting and, and appointing uh, people to the probation department. And I appointed the first black probation uh, director here in Detroit. And, and so I got a call one day, and it's from Thurgood. He says, Damon, I hear you. Are, are pondering whether you should go to the Court of Appeals. Are you losing your mind? I, I said, what do you mean, Thurgood? He says, if you offered, if they ask you to go there, you go there. Don't you dare just spend your time uh, there in the Eastern District of Michigan as chief judge. I want you on the Court of Appeals. You can do some good there, too. I, mean, I remember Mordecai Johnson coming to the law school, and he talked about Mahatma Gandhi, and he said, when Mahatma Gandhi died, who was a lawyer, all of his possessions could be put on top of his briefcase. Well, that's not quite what I think my class wanted to hear, but I've never forgotten it. And I remember Thurgood Marshall coming to our law school, where he was a graduate, obviously, and with tears in his eyes, he said, this is Charlie Houston's law school. Charlie Houston was his dean. And can you imagine between the Montgomery Boswell Cart and, and the sit ins of 60, you were hearing that from Thurgood Marshall? Hasty, as I learned many years later, had said, you know, Thurgood, you need to hire that boy. He, he, he would be a good person. So that's how, you know. Had it's, you know, had I taken low and said, yes, and I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll give up my membership and stuff like that, I would have been writing these little form letters and been very unhappy about it. But again, by doing what you think is right, you know, which, which was not to accept that, um, I got another experience working at the NACP in Pittsburgh, and then Thurgood coming through with the story that Bill Hasty had told him and get me into really exciting, exciting work that I probably wouldn't have gotten into without that. There was this very quiet uh, and, and respectful, but absolutely powerful professor uh, at Harvard that I met that made everything different, and that was Derek Bell. The light bulbs came on, uh, light bulbs came on when I met Derek because uh, he was doing not the work that I wanted to do, but focus on the issues about race and racism in American law. And boy, how important it was to see a black man say these things are important. You can't become a lawyer 
and try to understand the Constitution if you don't understand race. So he validated all the things I've been thinking about. And for me, uh, that was the defining moment that uh, if you're going to be a lawyer, you have to not be paranoid, but aware of how all these other issues that are important to you uh, are also important in the context of law. We didn't talk about race in torts. We didn't talk about race in criminal law. We didn't talk about race in property. We didn't talk about race in contracts. We didn't talk about race in civil procedure. But they were relevant to every single one of those topics that I'd taken in the first year. And Derek Bell just opened up my mind to the possibilities uh, of race and the necessity of seeing uh, how the legal system works in the context of race. You know, I think that the civil rights movement probably had the biggest influence on my life, the participants in that. Not just Dr. King or Malcolm X, but Bob Moses and Fannie Lou Hamer and uh, Rosa Parks and you know, E.J. Nixon and you know, all the characters uh, that made up that process, uh, I think, are uh, the folks who ended up having the biggest impact on my life. Their stories uh, uh, tell me what ordinary people can do in extraordinary times. But I was volunteering at the local NAACP after the sit-in movement, and um, I sat in at the city hall. And I didn't go back to the city hall from 1960 until I went back when the Democratic Convention was in Atlanta, and Andy Young was the mayor of the city. Um, and it showed you again how much change was possible. But that got me volunteering for the NAACP and seeing how many poor people, black people, um, were filing complaints, couldn't get lawyers because white lawyers didn't take civil rights cases. And if they didn't have the money to pay, they couldn't get a lawyer. And that made me wonder what in the world I was thinking about going back abroad or trying to go into the foreign service. So the sit-in movement and the civil rights movement and the formation of SNCC in 1960 um, all were the determining factors in the next stage of my life, which has led to my work now. In the back of my mind, I always wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. But when I was a senior in college, I mean a senior in high school, mm -hmm. my most important uh, focus was that I had to go to Harvard because I had to vindicate my father's experience of not being able to finish. I remember Lonnie and I uh, and others uh, participated in a, in a criminal case uh, that was tried in Selma, Alabama, um, within, uh, within sight of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in the federal courthouse there. Um, we had a... Um, we had quite an experience defending that uh, case. We had some local counsel, some of whom were just incredibly colorful and, uh, and interesting. We spent um, weeks and weeks uh, on dirt roads in Perry County trying to find witnesses and trying to make them comfortable uh, with telling us their stories and preparing our, uh, our defense in the wake of what felt at the time like very much a hostile U.S. attorney and a hostile judge. Um, we tried that case for about three weeks' time. We, um, we got a not guilty verdict on all counts. And when the, ju when the jury announced their um, verdict, um, the co courtroom was absolutely packed with people from the community who had found their voice in the course of uh, this defense. And, and people just burst into song. And the uh, judge kept trying to get uh, order, and they were just singing hymns at, uh, at that. I'll never forget it. It took me uh, three years of law school in Bakke to realize that, you know what? We have never, ever, ever made uh, uh, an unequivocal, concerted, uh, uh, and principled commitment to racial justice in the law, uh, despite pronouncements by our highest court. Uh, and here we are nearly 50 years after Brown, uh, and as remarkable as it seems, and as important as Brown is and necessary, uh, my sense then was, my God, we have not even had a chance to start to address 240 years of slavery uh, in this country, uh, and we're cutting back with the first efforts to promote civil rights and racial justice. What I'd like to be able to say is that at the end of my career, my involvement in public service advanced opportunity for the African-American community in a significant way. If only a few of us were getting through, if only a few of us were getting over 
uh, the horizon, and we weren't letting the ladder back down or letting the rope over to bring somebody else, that our modest success were ultimately a sign of our community's failure. And it was that sense that we had not done enough. Being successful on our own was not nearly enough. Achieving the highest levels of accomplishment was not nearly enough to transform uh, America's sense of outrage. So that to me has been sort of a lifelong challenge. So I'm going to become a lawyer and I'm going to try to use these tools to do something that's absolutely fundamental and essential to the progress of, of, of uh, uh, people of African descent. I can do no less. Uh, that's the challenge that the uh, Harvard Law School degree uh, posed on me, and that's the challenge that I uh, embraced uh, when I stood there in, in June 1978 saying, okay, now you're a lawyer. It's time to do something. That is a remarkable presentation of a remarkable group of lawyers. What I'd like to do is to just take a few minutes to kind of put those remarks in context. And I'm gonna start with this. Uh, the history of Blacks and the American legal profession dates back long before this nation's founding. You know, quite literally, this nation was built on the black backs of enslaved African-Americans since at least 1619. And by the time the delegates gathered to sign the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and subsequently in Philadelphia to debate the Constitution in 1787, there were already more than 700,000 slaves in the United States, accounting for 18% of our population. Look, the legal profession is justly proud that 25 of the 56 men who signed the declaration and 32 of the 55 framers of the constitution were lawyers. But what the profession often doesn't say is that many of these lawyers were slave owners and all enshrined slavery into the nation's founding documents, most famously in the constitution's clause counting enslaved African-Americans as only three fifths of a human being. The status of black people as property in this country defined their relationship to the law for the next century. And indeed defined the status of law here in the United States more generally. Yet remarkably, even before the civil war, a few black Americans managed to become lawyers in the United States. Look, records are sparse and incomplete, but we know that there were a handful, including Moses Simon, who attended the Litchfield Law School in Connecticut, one of the first law schools in the United States and practiced law briefly in New York in 1811. Or Malcolm Bowling, who the great legal historian and Howard Law professor J.K. Clay Smith uh, credits as being the nation's truly the nation's first black lawyer when he was admitted to the bar in the state of Maine in 1844. And of course, there is the great John Mercer Langston, whose story I will return to below. All managed to become lawyers before 1860. But eventually, as we all know, it would take the bloodiest war in American history to begin to change both the legal status of black Americans and quite frankly, the status of American law. The key element for this transaction, of course, was the ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1868 and the 15th Amendment in 1870. But in the year between these two momentous legal changes were two events that would prove equally consequential in the history of black lawyers. In 1869, Howard University School of Law welcomed its first six students with John Mercer Langston serving as the school's first dean. Howard would go on to become the most important institution for training black lawyers in the history of this country. But that same year, 1869, George Lewis Ruffin became the first black lawyer to graduate from Harvard Law School. And again, according to the great Howard Law Professor J. Clay Smith, the first to complete formal legal education anywhere in the United States. 
Ruffin would go on to an incredibly distinguished career as a lawyer and eventually becoming the first black judge in Massachusetts. But equally important, Harvard Law School would go on to become the second most important source for graduating black lawyers in the history of this country. And the relationship between Howard Law School and Harvard Law School would not only reshape the black bar, but the American legal profession and indeed our entire constitutional democracy. This relationship can be embodied in a single person. And that is of course, the great Charles Hamilton Houston. Born in Washington DC, Houston was a brilliant student at Harvard Law School, graduating in 1922 as the first black member of the prestigious Harvard Law Review. After a brief time in private practice with his father, who was also a lawyer, Houston was persuaded by Howard University Mor President Mordecai Johnson, who was spoken about in the video, to become the vice dean of Harvard Law, at Howard Law School. And Houston was determined to turn Howard into the kind of world-class law school that he had experienced at Harvard, but one with a distinct purpose, to create black lawyers who would become, in his words, social engineers for justice. To accomplish this goal, Houston took drastic action he canceled Howard's night program, a program that his own father had attended. And he basically replaced much of the faculty, bringing in a world-class group of scholars, including William Henry Hasty, who had followed Houston to become a superstar law student at Harvard Law School and the second black to become an editor at the, Har at the Harvard Law Review. These had drastic consequences, these changes. And by 1933, uh, Houston came in 1929. By 1933, the student body at Howard had been slashed from 55 to 11 students. But luckily, one of those 11 students who entered in 1930 was Thurgood Marshall. Marshall's career in history are well known to many and I won't take the time to repeat it here. His step-by-step -step litigation campaign under the tutelage of Charles Hamilton Houston, who was his mentor throughout his life, is well documented, most importantly in the important book by Richard Kluger, Simple Justice, which all should be re read again today. But I just wanna highlight three aspects that really defined the shape of the black bar for years to come. One, and most importantly, Houston and Marshall were determined that the struggle for equal rights and racial justice would be led by black lawyers. It had not been up until that time that legal NAACP had employed almost exclusively white lawyers. Second, the first target for Thurgood Marshall in his step-by-step -step desegregation campaign was a law school. And not just any law school, the University of Maryland Law School, a law school that Thurgood Marshall in another age would have attended being a native of Baltimore. The law school was right down the street from his house. But Marshall knew not even to apply because he knew that the University of Maryland Law School did not accept black students. That lawsuit and a series of other lawsuits uh, that Marshall brought against law schools uh, ended up creating the new generation of black lawyers, either for those like Donald Murray who were able to attend what had previously been an all white law school or because of the reaction of Southern states to try to create quote, separate but equal law schools, which ended up creating many of the historically black law schools that we still have today, including prominently Texas Southern University School of Law, which is appropriately named after Thurgood Marshall. Third, Houston and Marshall 
created a new model of a public interest lawyer, a full-time public interest lawyer uh, that had never existed before. But at the same time, Marshall recognized that there couldn't be enough full-time public interest lawyers to prosecute the campaign that he and Houston had in mind. And so from the beginning, they always enlisted prominent black lawyers in private practice to engage in the struggle. Lawyers like Raymond Pace Alexander, Robert Ming, George E.C. Hayes, and we could name many others. Once again, this last point has a person who embodies this ideal, and his name is William T. Coleman, Jr. Bill Coleman was yet another brilliant Harvard Law School student who became the third black editor on the prestigious Harvard Law Review. And when he graduated in 1947, he had won every award that was possible to win at Harvard Law School. But unlike Houston and Hasty, uh, Coleman did not aspire to be a full-time civil rights lawyer. Instead, as he later recalled, uh, from the time I went to Penn, he said, I felt that the real power structure was not the guy who got to be a minister, got to be an undertaker, got to be a federal judge or worked for the government. It was the businessman. And therefore, I just knew that's where I wanted to be. It should have been easy for Coleman to fulfill this dream with his incredible credentials. But notwithstanding the fact that he graduated at the top of his class at Harvard Law School, that he was on the Harvard Law Review, that he eventually went on to become a law clerk for Felix Frankfurter, making him the first black law school law clerk in the history of the Supreme Court. When he went to look for a job in his native Philadelphia, he could not get a single offer. So instead, he went to New York, where he was given a job by a relatively small but important and growing law firm named at the time Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. And he began the integration of the corporate bar. Now, right now, we think of Paul Weiss as one of the most prestigious law firms in America, kind of thinking of it as a Wall Street law firm, but that's not actually its roots. And this is important uh, because Paul Weiss was in many ways started in opposition to that tra tradition by Catholic and Jewish lawyers who were not welcome, quite frankly, in white shoe law firms. And as a result, as William Coleman later reflected, he said, they had to hire me because they understood that they too had not been allowed into these important spaces. Now, Coleman actually wasn't the first lawyer, black lawyer to be hired by a kind of New York firm. In fact, that honor belongs to the great singer, Paul Robeson, who many people don't know went to Columbia Law School, graduated in 1923 and was actually briefly hired by a law firm on Wall Street only to leave shortly thereafter when a stenographer refused to, quote, take dictation from a nigger. And that was a small beginning when Coleman was hired by Paul Weiss. That same year, Barbara Scott Priscill, a 1947 graduate of Yale Law School, uh, became the first black lawyer hired at a similar Midtown firm and perhaps even more significantly, its first female associate. Indeed, Paul Weiss would go on to make history in many respects, and we're gonna to talk to one of those uh, incredible black lawyers in a minute, but Paul Weiss hired the brilliant Polly Murray, who had graduated at the top of her class at Howard Law School after actually unsuccessfully trying to gain admission to Harvard Law School, which at the time did not admit women. But while Coleman went on to become a brilliant corporate lawyer, name partner eventually at a top Philadelphia law firm and a, uh, eventually a California law firm, secretary of transportation, sitting on major boards, 
He never forgot his deep commitment to civil rights, even though he pursued a different path. And he worked with Thurgood Marshall on the litigation leading up to Brown eventually signing the brief. Coleman therefore embodies really the twin legacies of Brown versus Board of Education. On the one hand, Brown stood for equality through integration, but at the same time, it stood for social justice through law. Indeed, it is fair to say that the Brown decision rescued the promise of American democracy from the, from the hypocrisy of slavery and Jim Crow. But in the early years, the only integration that actually happened was actually in the judiciary with those very social engineers for justice themselves. In 1961, Thurgood Marshall was appointed to the Second Circuit. In 1964, Spotswood Robinson was uh, appointed to the District Court for the District of Columbia. 1966, Constance Baker Motley appointed to the Southern District of New York. In 1972, the great Robert Carter was appointed uh, to the Southern District of New York. But change in the rest of the legal profession was almost non-existent. There was a trickle in the first few years. Actually, 1961, Sam Pierce became the first black partner in a New York law firm, the law firm of Battle Fowler. In 1962, Amalia Kearse, who would go on to become a federal judge, was hired as the first Black associate as Hughes, Hubbard, and Reed. And in 1965, Harry Edwards, became the, who also became a federal judge, would become the first Black lawyer hired by any major Chicago law firm when he became an associate at Safar Shaw. But for the most part, integration didn't happen for the first 10 years after Brown. There's a great book by the sociologist or actually political scientist, Gerald Rosenberg called The Hollow Hope that shows that there was almost no change in the integration of American society in those first two, 10 years, particularly in elite institutions. And just like today, which we'll talk about in a minute, it took mass protests, this time led by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. along with other legendary figures like John Lewis and the Reverend C.T. Vivian, who we tragically lost this year to force change. And that change came in the form of legislation. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968. These laws in turn put pressure on all sectors of American society to finally desegregate, including higher education. George Lewis Ruffin was the first black lawyer to graduate from Harvard Law School in 1869. But in the class of 1965, almost 100 years later, there was still only one black lawyer in the Harvard Law School graduating class, and that was the great Conrad Harper. But that summer, Harvard began to embark on a program that spread to many law schools around the country that had a dramatic effect in increasing the number of black lawyers. They instituted a summer program to recruit talented juniors from historically black colleges and universities to be interested in law school. The express idea of the program was that no one who was brought there would actually be allowed to go to Harvard Law School. It was to seed other law schools. But midway through the program, faculty members teaching the program went to the dean and said, there are two people here who we must admit immediately. One's name was Reginald Lewis, and the other was James Allen McPherson. Reginald Lewis, as many of you know, went on to an incredible career, starting actually at Paul Weiss went on to found the first country's first black Wall Street law firm and eventually became a billionaire, writing the book, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? That inspired a generation of blacks to go into not just corporate law, but the business world in general. McPherson went on to become an award-winning author, eventually winning the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and a MacArthur Genius Award and a Guggenheim Fellowship just an example of the fact that this was not affirmative action. This was giving talent its due. 
This became a slow but painful process of integration in the American legal profession. In 1960, there were only 2,100 black lawyers in the entire country, only 880 more than there were in 1930 when Thurgood Marshall graduated from law school. By 1990, there were 30,000 black lawyers. And by 2008, 40,000. Today, there are close to 65,000 black lawyers. But at least we get too uh, comfortable with that. It's still only 5% of the legal profession. And many of those lawyers are practicing in just the same way that they were practicing when Thurgood Marshall was himself a practicing lawyer before he joined the Legal Defense Fund, eking out a living, uh, representing uh, giving badly needed legal services to black individuals and small black businesses and operating in what was called actually by E. Franklin Frazier, a starvation profession in the 1930s and remains for many today. Nor has there been a huge amount of change in the corporate world. In 1996, I wrote an article called Why Are There So Few Black Lawyers in Corporate Law Firms and Institutional Analysis. And it was the first major law review article to take on this topic. And I was wrote the article because 40 years after Brown, less than 2% of the associates and 1% of the partners in the nation's 250 top law firms were black. Now, since 1996, there have been many notable changes in this country, not the least of which is the election of the country's first black president, himself a lawyer, himself a Harvard Law School graduate, as is his is his amazing wife, Michelle. But when we look at the legal profession in the corporate sector, after rising slowly for several years, the number of black associates or their percentage has actually fallen since 2009 in the country's top law firms and the country's uh, law firms only have 2% or fewer of their partners are black. And just to drive this point home, in 2019, there were seven top firms in the top 100 that had no black equity partners and 20 only had one. And while we see better progress in other parts of the profession, no one should be satisfied with where we are today. Look, where we are today is in the midst of unprecedented times. We are living through a global public health crisis, a global economic crisis, and most important for our purpose, increasingly global calls for social and racial justice. Since the murder of George Floyd and Bre Breonna Taylor, it's now clear that these issues have moved at least for the moment to the forefront of our consciousness and corporate America has been responding. We've seen things like NASCAR banning the Confederate flag, Princeton taking down Woodrow Wilson's name, Mississippi taking the stars and bars off its state flag. We've seen corporate funding for important social justice organizations to the tune of over 3 billion by leading companies like GM, Home Depot, AT&T and State Farm. We've seen an uh, explosion in supplier diversity programs, uh, including at Coca-Cola, $500 million, PayPal, $550 million, Pepsi, $400 million. And we've seen a whole new kind of social justice, invest, justice investing, including Alphabet, Google's parent company, giving $5.75 billion sustainability bond, which includes $175 million to Black-owned businesses, and 100 billion to promote minorities and creators and artists. And we've seen pressure to put more and more minorities on corporate boards and to hire into top leadership positions. Here's what I want to emphasize. These things are not just happening by themselves. Instead, these things are what I call the dividend that we are now finally receiving for the slow but nevertheless important progress we have made now in the over 60 years since Brown at integrating America's first educational institutions of higher education, including law schools, and from there, other parts of American society. There are a small 
but important cadre of Blacks, particularly Black lawyers, I want to emphasize for this conversation, who have moved into important positions of power and who have used their power, just like William Coleman, to try to open up additional opportunities for African Americans in this country. And I predict that the new generation coming behind them will be even more determined. But there's no guarantee for success. We've been at this for a very long time. COVID and the unrest around social justice shows us just how unequal and how fragile our social structure is and how deeply race is embedded in these questions. So the question is this, are we going to retreat as a profession uh, into our comfortable ways of doing things? Or are we going to learn from the lessons of these incredible historical figures, these black lawyers who paved the way for us to not only continue to make the progress we have been making, but to push for bold change? I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know this. History repeatedly shows us that fortune favors the bold. We are incredibly fortunate today to have three leaders who in my judgment exemplify uh, the great tradition of black lawyers as social engineers for justice to help us discuss these issues. Uh, I will give them only the briefest of introductions because we could take up all the rest of our time together to introduce them and their many accomplishments, but you know them all already. Sherilyn Eiffel, who is the director counsel of the Legal Defense Fund, following directly in the footsteps of Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall. Ted Wells, who is now the co-head of litigation and one of the most important partners, not just at Paul Weiss, but in all of corporate America. And Kenneth Frazier, who is the chairman and CEO of Merck. My job here is the enviable one of getting these three amazing leaders to talk about the connection between the history that I tried to sketch out for all of us and where we are today. And Sherilyn, I hope you don't mind if I start with you because you really are the direct lineal descendant of that history. And I wonder as you listen to it, you knew it all already, but still when you sit in your current chair and you think about the legacy of those great lawyers, what does that mean for you today? Well, first of all, thank you so much, David. I'm thrilled and honored to be part of this conversation. Um, there is no question that I would not be who I am without uh, that history that you so powerfully laid out and that we saw in that video. When I was a girl, I wanted to become a civil rights lawyer. And um, that dream you know, happened um, to come true. And it came true for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is that I happened to be born at a time when if you were a smart little girl, people said things like, you should be a lawyer. Uh, that was not the experience of Pauli Murray, who you described in your opening, who really was a pioneer uh, in becoming a woman lawyer. But I wanted to be involved in the civil rights movement. That's what was so important to me because I saw these amazing videos and films and my father talked about politics and black people and our struggles so much in our home. And that was my goal. Uh, did I ever believe I would be in this position? No, I did not. But I knew I wanted to make an, an incredible contribution. I was very impressed and moved by um, not only the power of the attorneys that I was able to see on television. And I say on television because I did not meet a lawyer in my actual life until I went to law school. My law professors were the first lawyers I met. Uh, but my imagination just ran wild at seeing uh, the way these lawyers presented themselves. And then, of course, as I grew older and had a, a, a better opportunity to dig deep into that history and to see some of them at work, 
Um, it was just incredibly inspiring. And I was moved by their power. I was moved by a sense of certainty uh, that they had about who they were and what they were trying to accomplish. And it was very apparent to me that these people stood at a moral high ground in this democracy. They were saying things and describing American democracy and the way the, live, the law works in the lives of marginalized people in ways that made it clear that they were bringing revelations to people who uh, seemed not to know this truth. And they were confident in the truth that they were advancing. And I found this so powerful and so compelling, and I wanted to be part of them. And I'm part of them, so it's a dream come true for me. Well, Ted, uh, you are also a lineal descendant. Uh, you know, I don't know that many people know the history of Paul Weiss and all of the opportunities it created. And I'll just say this, Ted, I remember distinctly the day that I heard that you had been recruited over essentially to take over from the great Arthur Lyman uh, and run that litigation department. And that was a revelation uh, for all of us who studied the careers of black lawyers that had never happened before. And, and I guess I want to ask you that same question as you sit uh, at this uh, important position, but also at this important time in history, how do you think about that legacy of those black lawyers and how it influences where you are today? I was born in Washington, DC in 1950. And at the time of my birth, Plessy B. Ferguson was still the law. Separate but equal was the doctrine that controlled. And the DC public school system was legally segregated. Um, when the Brown decision was issued in May of 1954, the DC public school system was one of the five Brown cases. And the system was uh, integrated. And I started kindergarten and the fall of 1955 under the Brown versus Board of Education decision desegregation order. And I've always considered myself a child of the Brown decision. And when I was fortunate enough to be admitted to Harvard Law School and enrolled in the fall of 1973, I came under the tutelage as many people on this panel did, of the only black tenure professor at Harvard Law School, Derek Bell. Um, and Derek Bell, who had worked for LDF, worked for Thurgood Marshall, was the best friend of Robert Carter, Thurgood Marshall's right-hand person. Derek Bell took all of us under his arm and he said to us collectively, you were one of the largest classes of black law students ever to enter Harvard Law School. And I want to tell you all, everybody cannot go and work for LDF. Everybody cannot become Thurgood Marshall. I am telling each of you, some of you will become great civil rights lawyers and work for LDF. But most of you will go out into other parts of society. And your mission is to integrate all of American society, but I want you to take with you at all times an LDF state of mind. I want you to have the state of mind of a civil rights lawyer and to understand the role of the law in the history of this country, to understand the role of race. So if you become the head of Merck, the CEO, I want you to look at things through the prism of a civil rights lawyer, or if you become the head of the litigation department at Paul Weiss. And so Derek Bell had a vision that we would go into every part of American society, integrate it, but at all times have an LDF state of mind. So we are all connected. The last point I will, I will make is that my generation of lawyers, I think, is critically important in terms of the lineage issue because we are the last generation of lawyers that had direct contacts with Thurgood Marshall, with Robert Carter, with Derek Bell, with Constance Baker Motley. 
I mean, David, you clerk for Thurgood Marshall. He is not some abstract figure to you. And for all of us of our generation, our responsibility is to make sure that that history continues and that the next generation when we pass the baton to understands our history and understands the nature of what is a continuing struggle that will take, unfortunately, many generations uh, to overcome in terms of racial equality and social justice. Well, Ken, Ted rightly uh, held up Derek Bell, who I know was a, a great mentor to you and to me, uh, and really uh, did so much to transform Harvard Law School and everyone he came into contact with. Uh, but I think Ted only exaggerates slightly when he said that Derek could have contemplated that one day one of us would become the CEO of Merck. I don't think even Derek with his big vision could have seen that. And, you know, certainly when you and I were in law school together, I don't think either of us would have imagined either that one of us would be a tenured professor at Harvard Law School and the other would be uh, the CEO of Merck. Uh, but your trajectory has, has just been amazing. And uh, you started off in a law firm, you became a partner, you became, uh, you went in house, you became a general counsel, and now you are a CEO. And, and I wonder how, again, the history, the same question I've asked others, that history that we just talked about, how does that LDF frame of mind, to use Ted's phrase, kind of resonate with you now in terms of the, the incredible responsibilities that you have as the CEO of Merck? You know, first of all, you know, Ted describes himself as a beneficiary of Brown as a kindergartner. I was born just about six months after the Brown decision. Uh, my dad had a third grade education or what passed for a third grade education for a black child born in South Carolina in 1900. Um, my younger sister and I came along at a time when the city fathers in Philadelphia decided that they wanted to give a few little black children, colored children in those days, an opportunity to go to the best schools. And so I'm a direct beneficiary of a mindset that was created by Thurgood Marshall. As it relates to my practice, um, I'm a very fortunate person because the very first case that I had as a practicing lawyer, the client was Bill Coleman. <laughs> And I thought I was a pretty spiffy young lawyer. I'd done this memorandum of law on a particular case. The facts don't matter. The law doesn't matter. But the fact of the matter is I submitted it uh, to the partner in my firm, who then sent it over to Bill Coleman. Uh, and then about a month or two later, I got called into a conference room, and there sat the great man. And uh, he explained to me uh, what the difference was between being a good lawyer and being a great lawyer. Uh, a good lawyer could report what the law was. A great lawyer could anticipate what the law could and should be. Uh, and uh, I had the benefit th thereafter as a lawyer in Philadelphia of having Bill Coleman, who had, by that time had moved to Washington, continued to show great interest in me. Uh, and not in a way that was meant to, to make me feel good about myself, but again, to hold those standards up. And so I have to say that I have a direct lineage back to these lawyers too. Uh, and when I came to Merck, frankly, um, I knew that my responsibility uh, as the CEO of Merck, uh, I'm the one person in the company that gets to allocate capital. And I needed to allocate that capital in ways that would make a difference to people in the world, including people in Africa, as well as to African-Americans. So Sherilyn, I... I talked about how it took both Brown and an incredible social movement on the ground led by Martin Luther King and, and many other great heroes to produce the kind of hallmarks of what we would think of as the modern civil rights movement and legislation. 64 Civil Rights Act, Title VII, 65 Voting Rights Act, 68 Fair Housing Act. I think it's fair to say that all three of them are under assault today. And I wonder how you think as the director of council at LDF uh, about that and, and about how to mobilize 
black lawyers in the way that those black lawyers were mobilized working together with the community to produce those great uh, accomplishments. What are you looking for from black lawyers to protect those accomplishments and to move them forward into the second decade, the, the middle decades of the 21st century? Well, the first thing, David, is we need a very clear-eyed vision of what in fact happened in the years following both Brown and following what we think of as the formal civil rights movement, because it's important for us to remember that there was no period in which there was not incredible resistance to the progress that these lawyers were pioneering and that civil rights activists were pioneering. Um, you know, you talked about what was happening in the 10 years after Brown, the, what is it, the hollow, the hollow truth, or I can't hollow. remember. Yeah, uh, it, you know, the, 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 the progress was very, very slow and was met with incredible resistance, including uh, in the profession. And so part of being a civil rights lawyer is always fighting a rear guard action while you're also trying to push the envelope and till new soil and open new fields uh, in the battle. And you have to be able to do those two things at the same time, to be able to defend the wins and then to be able to keep moving forward. That's what Marshall always said, you have to keep moving or they'll run you over. Um, and we're seeing that, we've been seeing that fairly consistently. I think about something like affirmative action, which has been you know, resisted from the moment that it began in, in university admissions. We're still involved in litigating affirmative action cases and it's likely that it will be back before the Supreme Court uh, this term. There's never been a, a, a period of uncontested embrace of the extraordinary accomplishments that uh, the LDF and that civil rights activists were able to accomplish. I mean, if you think about it, we just heard uh, Ted and Ken talk about their experiences as young men in a generation before me, um, but but the first experiences of Brown. But if you look at the the uh, elementary school picture, the first grade pic picture in my office at the Legal Defense Fund right now, you will see me as the only black girl in a class of white students. Because busing began in the really late 1960s in the North in places like New York, really because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the fear that uh, Northern school districts had that they would lose federal funding. So that's, I mean, that's years, right? That's, that's 15 years after Brown or 10 years after Brown that they're just beginning the nascent efforts to begin busing. And what happens almost immediately after busing begins is the incredible, often violent, resistance to busing in the North, in places like Boston. So it's fighting these continuous battles at the same time that you're identifying strategies for the future, and then being able to catch hold of moments when transformation can happen. And I always say those moments are, are made up of three ingredients. They require grassroots mobilization and activism. They require terrific uh, visionary civil rights lawyering and a kind of politically transformative movement. That's what happened in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And the good news is that's actually the moment we're in right now where all of those things are happening at the same time. That's kind of the sweet spot. And then what do you need in terms of the actual attorneys themselves? Well, you know, people want to work at the Legal Defense Fund, um, but it takes a very particular kind of lawyer to work at the Legal Defense Fund. And I always say, after we deal with the excellence, the excellent education, the training, uh, the, the excellent writing, all of those core skills that are necessary to do this work, we need lawyers at the Legal Defense Fund who are as eloquent, as passionate, and as persuasive, and as empathetic in a meeting in the church basement in a community in Alabama as they are in the well of the Supreme Court. That's the quality I'm always looking for. The connection to community, the standard of excellence, the vision for imagining that you can take a story that begins in Selma, Alabama or Terrebonne Parish, Louisiana, and that story is worthy of being told at the highest court in the land and told with power and eloquence and passion. And we're gonna to continue to do that. We do that right now, even with the headwinds that we've been facing. One of the ways you stay inspired in this work is just seeing the incredible vision, courage, and energy of our young lawyers who are so committed to this work. Well, Ted, I know that uh, you have helped to support this work in so many ways, including chairing the Legal Defense Fund Board, 
but I wonder about the, the, the kind of the Bill Coleman side of things. That is, how do lawyers in the private sector uh, advance this work? And, and I really would like you to reflect on two things. One is, uh, how do they work effectively with Cheryl Lynn's lawyers to try to amplify their voices? But also, how do they bring change in their own institutions? I mean, the statistics I gave, Ted, which I'm sure you know better than I, are incredibly depressing. Seven top law firms with zero black partners, 20 black law, 20 law firms with one black partner. Um, you know, the integration of that part of the bar hasn't gone that far from when we first started studying it. So I wonder how do you think as a, as a senior leader in the legal profession and in one of the most important and progressive law firms in the world, how do you think about inspiring and training lawyers to do both these kinds of work? Well, that was the vision of Derek Bell that we would end up doing both types of work. And one of the things the major law firms are able to do, to use Cheryl Lynn's phrase, is to help amplify the ability of LDF to carry out its mission. So for example, when LDF filed the lawsuit against uh, the Mayor Bloomberg administration to try to stop uh, the stop and frisk practices in New York City, Paul Weiss, my law firm, partnered with LDF in that lawsuit that went for many years, we spent, if you look at the computer sheets, you know, over $10 million of lawyer time on that. And so we were able to, again, amplify and create synergies for LDF in terms of what it could do. So LDF has a long tradition of not only partnering um, with Black lawyers throughout the South, but partnering with major law firms in order to have an impact nationally far beyond the size of its staff. But in terms of where we are today with respect to big law, uh, the results continue to be depressing. Um, the only way I am able to rationalize it and not be paralyzed by my anger is to recognize that this attempt to integrate major law firms did not really start until 1950 when Bill Coleman became the first black associate at a major law firm. And then Pauli Murray followed him as the first black woman at Paul Weiss a few years later. But we are still in, for all practical purposes, you know, the second generation. Uh, this is a battle that uh, is going to take many years. And I, and, and I, will, I will say this, uh, I think it's very important for us to all keep a historical perspective because, because otherwise you can become paralyzed by your anger about the lack of progress. And I'll, I'll tell you a quick story uh, involving Cheryl Lynn and myself. In 2015, when the movie Selma was released, uh, there was a special showing of the movie at the White House by President Obama. And Cheryl Lynn was, of course, invited as the head of LDF. And I was fortunate enough to be invited as the former chair of the board of LDF. And neither one of us had ever been to the White House Theater. And it was a really big deal for us. And you had the entire staff, uh, 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 all the actors uh, from Selma. So you had Oprah Winfrey there. Uh, and we were like, you know, two little kids with big eyes. Um, but John Lewis was the real hero that night at the, at the uh, showing of the film. Cheryl Lynn and I, we went with President Obama and the other attendees to the Oval Office right after the showing of the movie. And we marveled how we had just watched this uh, civil rights battle to pass the Voting Rights Act. 
uh, in the movie, many of the scenes taking place in the Oval Office. And now we were in the Oval Office with a black person as the president. Yet Cheryl Lynn, the next morning, had to fly to Ferguson, Missouri, to deal with the protests in Ferguson, dealing with police brutality. And we were trying to reconcile how we should feel about Barack Obama being the president, us being in the White House, and Cheryl Lynn having to go to Ferguson the next day. And we were both kind of depressed, to be, to be honest with you. And John Lewis came over and said, God, both of you look like something's wrong. What's wrong? And we told him how we were trying to handle reconciling the event that night and Cheryl Lynn going to Ferguson the next morning. And John Lewis said, you have to be optimistic. You have to have hope. He said, the two of you should remember, I'm the one that got hit in the head on the bridge. Okay, and I'm here with optimism because I never could have thought I would be in the Oval Office with a black person as president. And he said, recognize the struggle will continue, but you cannot be paralyzed by the speed of the progress or your anger. You have to remain optimistic. And remember, we are going to win this fight. So with respect to big law, civil rights in general, what we're facing right now uh, with the Trump administration, the issues of voter suppression and police brutality and systemic racism, we have to have the attitude of optimism and hope that John Lewis preached to Cheryl Lynn and I that night in the Oval Office at the White House. Well, Ken, that's a perfect segue to what I'd love to ask you because um, I've heard you speak many times about this eloquently about what's the role of the workplace and the kind of workplace that you run in terms of creating that hope and and uh, you know to to kind of bring the historical theme forward, as almost everybody knows, you yourself uh, uh, did an incredibly courageous act uh, with respect to uh, uh, what was going on in Charlottesville uh, about what that history, the history that was being invoked and then ignored or pretending like it wasn't there. But we're also in a historic moment uh, in which a company like yours is actually at the very intersection of public health, of the workplace, of the, the kind of structural inequalities that we're seeing played out uh, in our current moment, whether through protests or through COVID. And I wonder again, how do you feel as the CEO now? You know, you're in your own Oval Office. It's not quite as good as uh, Barack Obama's, but it's pretty good uh, in terms of a position of power and authority. And I know you feel very keenly how to use that power and authority to try to help with the kind of optimism about the trajectory of history that Ted left us with. Well, you know, David, I have to say that uh, I never expected to be a corporate CEO. Uh, like others, I went to law school because I was inspired by civil rights lawyers and then went to a private firm that did civil rights cases in pro bono and was able to do death penalty cases and things like that. So I always see myself as a lawyer. But to answer your question, I think the position that I have today allows me to do two things that are really important in this struggle. The first of all, one is to deal with the incredible stubborn disparities of health and healthcare that afflict our people. We now see, for example, with COVID-19, the huge disparities in death rates. Uh, in New York City, uh, an African-American woman is something like 10 times more likely to die in childbirth than a white counterpart. And even if you control for education, it doesn't matter. A black woman is still more likely uh, to die. So for where I sit in Merck, I have an opportunity uh, to ensure that we are focusing on those issues. Uh, to I can't win the same kind of freedoms that Cheryl Lynn can win uh, for people to vote, where they can live, et cetera, but I can help people win freedom from disease and suffering. So that's, that's one role that I have. 
The second role that I have is that I think corporations have an incredible power. Our government, the difference between the United States, I, I used to teach in South Africa. I got to teach with Leon Higginbotham and, and Cheryl Lynn's uh, predecessor, Julius Chambers, and, and during apartheid. And uh, when I think about the kind of racial division and the helplessness and the hopelessness that black people in South Africa felt, one thing comes to mind as a, as a difference between the US and South Africa. One, one is the stated creeds of our founding documents, which we've never lived up to. So let's put that to the side. The second is the power of the private sector in the United States. The United States has reinvented itself, itself several times. And a, and a big part of that is the talent, the resources, the power, the infrastructure of the private sector. So we need African-Americans at the upper echelon of all these corporations. You know, LinkedIn did a study recently that I thought was fascinating. It said that when it comes to promotions into senior management and board positions in, in corporate America, the process is to find qualified people and put them in the pool. But the decision is based on networks. It's based on relationships. And because of that, I often say to my friends, until we get fair representation of African-Americans in the senior corridors of these companies, black people will never be able to take advantage of those networks. And so it's really important for people in my position to make sure that you're pulling somebody else up with that ladder and not just being uh, the only African-American. There are, I think now at Roger Ferguson just stepped down I think there's only three African-Americans in the Fortune 500, which is abysmal. Uh, but I'm optimistic that if we do what we're supposed to do, we can bring people along with us. One of the- David, David can, I, can, I, can I respond oh, please, to something? Please, go ahead. Look, in terms of Derek Bell's vision, that we have black lawyers in every segment of society, but that those lawyers have a civil rights LDF state of mind. Ken Frazier exemplifies it. Just think about what he just said. He said he had done death penalty work. How many corporate CEOs can say they represented somebody who was on death row? And in Ken's case, he successfully got his client off of death row after many years of imprisonment. How many corporate CEOs can say, I went to South Africa and I taught in South Africa with people like Julius Chambers, who also is a former head of LDF. And how many corporate executives, when confronted with President Trump's refusal to react to the protests in Charlottesville, had the courage in a historical perspective to say, I will resign from my position on that commission he was serving on. Now he was followed by other corporate CEOs, but Ken, because of his background, because of his civil rights state of mind, because he understood his history and the importance of speaking out against what happened in Charlottesville, he did it. And that's what Derek Bell was talking about. We have to be corporate CEOs, but with a different state of mind where we look at things through the prism of the history of this country and race in this country and the continuing struggle for civil rights. Thank you, Ted. Well, it's completely true. And I wanna kind of end with something that builds on what you just said. Uh, but also shows that, uh, in other words, we don't just take these positions to be the same as the people who were always there. We take them to change. And we take them to bring, as you say, that LDF state of mind. But Sherilyn, one thing I've heard you speak about is, it's not just a state of mind, it's a style. And uh, I had the great pleasure of spending a year with Thurgood Marshall in his chambers, and he had a style. And I think that is true of many of the black lawyers who we have spoken about. And I wonder how you think about that element. In other words, bringing 
not just our political commitments, but our cultural diversity, our sense of rhythm, of humor, of style, and how that affects how we think about ourselves as black lawyers today. Oh no, absolutely, David. I always say that um, you know Thurgood Marshall and that team at the Legal Defense Fund, that early team, made being a lawyer cool. Um, you know, it made it look good. You know, Marshall had that trench coat, and he was often smoking a cigarette, and he had a skinny tie, and he had a kind of laconic air about him, and um, and even the style of lawyering. You know, even the way he spoke, he spoke like a normal person, <laughs> and he was able to tell stories about his experiences, uh, very often sprinkled with a sense of humor. Uh, he, he was not shy about letting his personality show. And that's actually important, especially for young people when you're thinking about who you want to be. Uh, there are many people who are not attracted to what the legal profession looked like before, a kind of very buttoned up pocket watch you know, uh, presentation. But, but what was presented by those legal defense fund lawyers was something that was really attractive and cool. And listen, the gender piece here is important to talk about too, and I would be remiss if I didn't raise this because you just said, David, the idea was not to do it the way it was done before. So I, I started out as a young lawyer at LDF. Uh, and so this is my second tour of duty with the organization. When I was a young lawyer at LDF, I started my family. Uh, I had just been married a year before and um, was having my first child during my first trials. I mean, I can remember driving through the Arkansas Delta looking for witnesses. I was about six months pregnant. Um, I remember weaning my, my first daughter to do my first appellate argument. I mean, I was fully in uh, beginning my family. And it was incredibly difficult because our cases are in the South. You're traveling all the time. Uh, I remember uh, landing at an airport in Oklahoma for depositions and calling my daughter's preschool and asking the teacher, could she do my daughter's hair because it was picture day and I knew my husband would make a mess of it. So I was doing all those things at the same time. And I remember having a conversation with Julius Chambers, who was the then director counsel, who I revered of the Legal Defense Fund about this struggle. In fact, I had a conversation with him about maternity leave. And he said, well, what have other women here done? And I said, what other women? There are, there, are, there are no other women here who have young children. I said, the only person I can think of is, is Constance Baker Motley, who was then many years sitting on the federal bench. And he said, well, go talk to Connie Motley. So I did. I called up Judge Motley and I said, I stammered and I said, hi, I'm Cheryl Eiffel. I'm an assistant counsel at the Legal Defense Fund. And Julius Chambers said, I should talk to you about, like, how do I do all of this? She said, sure, let's go to lunch. We went to lunch and it was the first of many meetings. She would later invite me as her guest to the Second Circuit Conference. I remember her saying to me, well, you need a live-in nanny. And I said, are, are you kidding me? I'm making $25,000 a year. I can't have a live-in nanny. But she had done it. She had raised her son, Joel, and she had been an active litigator desegre desegregating most of the Southern universities. I mean, a monumental force uh, in American law. And she had done it. And so now that I'm the head of the Legal Defense Fund, when I came in, back to the Legal Defense Fund one, Fund, one of the things I wanted to do most of all was make sure I was responsive to uh, our young lawyers with their families. And now most of our young lawyers, women and men, have young children. They want to have maternity and paternity leave. They want time for their families. Uh, and this is something I was able to really bring back to the organization as something I wanted to institutionalize in a very generous way. Uh, to really help the whole lawyer and to help us understand what it feels like to, to be devoted to this work, but also to be devoted to your family. So the generations, you know, when we talk about these generations of lawyers, uh, when I wrote my book, you know, Derek Bell was my, my inspiration who told me, you can go to a writing colony and have time to write. I was then teaching law school. And I said, a writing colony, How they'll never accept me. Yes, they will. This is the one you should apply to. So these lawyers continued paying it forward uh, to generations of lawyers showing us how it's done. And so things we didn't think were possible, how you presented yourself as a lawyer, that you could be accepted at a writing colony to go and write your book, uh, how you would raise children and be an active mom while being a litigator. These were also things uh, that they presented to us and that they were generous with sharing you know, the struggles of that, of that work and showing us how to navigate the process. That's also part of our obligation. It's part of our obligation, not just to create positions and space for black people to enter, but it's also important for us to show how it's done and to suggest that you have the ability when you enter these spaces to innovate, to do it your way, to be your kind of person, and that we want you to bring that to the table uh, when you enter these spaces. 
I like to think that um, so much of this comes from this cadre of attorneys who had this vision for themselves. They had no blueprint. They created it. That's what makes it so exciting to look at that history. We all have a blueprint. We're sitting here talking about all of these lawyers who came before us. They didn't have a blueprint. They made it up out of their own vision, their own imagination, their own conviction, their own determination, and their own dedication. That's what makes them so heroic. So I, I just, you know, lastly, just have to say something about Pauli Murray. Here's a woman who wrote the blueprint for two movements. Her piece, um, you know, states and, and state laws on race and color, Thurgood Marshall called the Bible, right, of the civil rights movement, because that was the document that basically said that it was important to frontally attack state segregation laws and that really underlay uh, Brown versus Board of Education. But she also wrote Jane Crow in the Law in 1965, which was the template for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who really kind of created the field of women's rights law. So much so that when Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote her Supreme Court brief in the groundbreaking case, Reed versus Reed, she put Pauli Murray's name on the brief, even though Pauli Murray had not worked on the case, because her work was so seminal, seminally important and influential in helping uh, Justice Ginsburg think about uh, discrimination and equality in the context of women as comparable to what was the struggle of black people to fulfill the promise of the Equal Protection uh, Clause of the 14th Amendment. So that's one black woman lawyer whose scholarship underlay two groundbreaking movements that are responsible for the four of us being able to be uh, on this panel today and have the work that we have and the success that we have had. So it's just, and, and again, no blueprint, no template, but just being true to themselves, having a vision for what the law could be, what America could be, and a dedication to the freedom of black people. It's They are just an extraordinary group of heroes that we can never credit enough for what they have done for us, but also for this country. So Ted, you're somebody I've always thought of as the, the epitome of cool. Uh, how do you do that in a corporate law context? And do you have a, a hero like that that kind of helped you to understand how to make your own way? You have always had your own style and you've brought a different style to the job that you're in right now today. Look, I, I have always seen part of my mission to break stereotypes and to try to send a message to the profession that being a great corporate trial lawyer is not something that is limited to white males, because that's the world image that most of us are brought up under. Um, the great trial lawyers, the great uh, corporate lawyers are white males, and it's not a place that Black folk, male or, male or female, are supposed to go to, nor are white women. And I've spent my entire life trying to break that image. I, I, will, I will say this. When um, Bill Clinton was elected president in 1992, um, I was offered two federal judgeships. Um, I was given my choice, a district court or, or, the, or the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. And I went to Bob Carter, who by that time had become one of my mentors because Derek Bell had passed me off uh, to Bob Carter to mentor me. And I asked Judge Carter, should I take the judgeship? And Bob Carter told me, you should not take the judgeship. I said, why not? He said, because you have been able to begin to break this glass ceiling that only white males are doing these big corporate cases. And I'm concerned that if you were to leave that niche that you've started in terms of cracking that glass, ceil glass ceiling, it may take years before somebody else does it. And he said, we can find somebody else uh, for that judgeship and somebody who will be good, but you've got to stay there. And he said to me, one of the mistakes he thought the LDF civil rights lawyers had made was that too many of them had followed Thurgood Marshall uh, onto the federal bench at the same time. Because Thurgood went, and then the next thing you, you saw, Spotswood Robinson went, Costum Baker Motley went, 
Bob Carter went and, he, and Bob said the entire brain trust, we didn't think about it, just how it happened. We were following Thurgood. Uh, and all of a sudden our brain trust all went and did the same thing. And he said, it's important to allocate resources and to realize each of us has to really exploit and soak the unique opportunities we've been given. So that Bob Carter said, Ted, you should remain in corporate law and litigation and try to break that image. He would have said the same thing to Ken Frazier, okay? And Ken will tell you, and he's told me the story before, how he was, you know, the general counsel and thinking about being the general counsel and how his mentors, uh, Mr. Vangelo said, no, you should think not just about being the general counsel, you should think about being the CEO. And, and, and Bob Carter and Derek Bell would have said, you should exploit that opportunity. But both of us and all everybody on this panel has been able to maintain who they are. We have remained our own person. We have done it our way. Okay, and, and, and that is what is important. We've, we've kept our sense of history. We've kept our style being however you were raised, what neighborhood you came up in. And we have not uh, sacrificed our, our upbringing and our background in an effort uh, to fit in, but rather we have set our own path in our own mold. And just like Thurgood had his own style, uh, every panel has their own style and it has not been uh, copying uh, what we saw some white lawyer do. So we've been able to marry our background and our profession and do it in a way that everybody knows we are race people. So Ken, I'm just gonna end with you because I know in addition to Roy Vangelos, you have two other incredible black lawyers who are role models in your moving into this job whose names we should call. One is Vernon Jordan and the other is Ken Chenault. Yes. And uh, I, I wonder just again, how you have thought about keeping your self authentic, because I think it's so important for young people who are gonna listen to this, that you can still succeed at the highest levels, but you don't have to give up on who you are. And I think you have done that and those role models have too. And I wonder if you could just say a word about that. Well, let me first start, let me first start by saying something to younger people. I've been in my firm two years and I got an offer from the U.S. Attorney's Office and I was on my way to the U.S. Attorney's Office and uh, there was one senior black partner in my firm, his name was Melvin Bro. He called a bunch of black partners together and they basically told me that they wanted me to stay because they said, you can go to the U.S. Attorney's Office later if you wish, but you need to stay on this track. You need to make partner. And I have to say, I've been very fortunate not just to have people a generation ahead of me as mentors, as exemplars of excellence and role models. I, when I wanted to be a trial lawyer, I, I always said to him, I want to be Ted Wells when I grow up. I may never grow up to be uh, Ted Wells, but I always wanted to be that. And when I decided to come over to the business side, the first call I got was from Ken Chenault. And Ted and Ken were two classes ahead of me in law school. Uh, when I was a, a first year student, I looked at them and I said, man, I'm going to school with grownups now. Uh, so. Uh, Ken calls me over to his office. It was very important because from time to time he would sit down with me and tell me about the sort of the unwritten rules of the C-suite that none of the white guys were ever going to tell me and they were extremely important. And then there's Vernon. There is no one like Vernon uh, because Vernon could go from the pool room to the boardroom. And what I always liked about Vernon was his mischievous approach to things. I always said, you know, I grew up in the inner city and we liked the bad boys more than the good boys. So to see someone like Vernon who was successful, who could be like the bad boy in the boardroom, I said, that's what I want to be like because that's what cool is like. <laughs> Thank you, Sherilyn, Ted and Ken for that amazing discussion. Now we're going to hear from the lawmakers advisory panel to the history uh, makers that advises the history makers. And it's an incredibly distinguished group of people. And I'm going to just read their names one at a time. 
Paulette Brown, senior partner at Lock Lord, the Honorable David H. Kaur, who's a retired U.S. District Judge, James L. Hudson, the former U.S. Executive Director, Channing Johnson, who's a partner at Loeb and Loeb, Catherine Lauderdale, who's the Chief Legal Officer at PBS, Sharice Lilly, who's the CEO of CRL Consulting, Virgil Roberts, who's the founder of Bobbitt and Roberts, Rodney Slater, who's the former United States Secretary of Transportation, Maurice Watson, who's of counsel at Hush Blackwell, and Fletcher Flash Wiley, formerly of counsel of Morgan Lewis and Bacchius. We are very honored that the first question to be asked is from Paulette Brown, uh, as I, most of you know, a legend here, the first uh, African-American woman to be the president of the American Bar Association. So Paulette, please ask your question. Thank you, thank you very much. It was a wonderful panel. I hold all of you in such high regard. Um, I have a, a, my question is, is that there were so many different areas that were covered. And, and my dear friend, Ted Wells, you know, you talk about, you know, where we are in history and how far we've come and how we should have optimism. And I am optimistic. But I also think about the fact of how much progress other groups who have come after us have made and sort of left us behind. Um, I, I think about in the law firm context, how blacks are still, their percentages are the lowest and black women, the absolute lowest, 0.75% of equity partners are black women. And so how do we take all of these pieces that you have talked about today, um, all of these areas to build uh, a, a solution or a strategy that is holistic in nature so that we can address multiple issues at the same time? What, what I would say, Paulette, is that we have to begin with accurate data. Right now, um, the data that is being disseminated about diversity efforts in big law firms does not reveal the true plight of African-American lawyers because many firms report data with respect to, quote, lawyers of color. And that data, uh, unless you unpack it, tends to hide the severity of the problem. And so I think what we have to demand uh, when corporations, for example, talk about uh, the work they are giving to African-American lawyers, um, that they be forced to break down the exact numbers and really not be permitted to not discuss how much work is being given uh, to lawyers of color in general or to white women. You, you, have, to, you have to demand that, that the data be broken down because when the data is broken down, that's the only time you can even begin to have the discussion because otherwise, um, you know, people hide behind this general phrase, lawyers of, cover, of color which really obfuscates the seriousness of the problem. Thank you, Ted. Our next question uh, comes from former Secretary of Transportation, uh, Rodney Slater. And I'll just say, Rodney, it's great to see you uh, because I'm getting to teach your daughter who's absolutely spectacular. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Professor Wilkins. I, I actually sent her a little note and she said, oh, nice. So I told her we were on the same program. But um, I'd also like to just mention um, uh, Secretary Coleman. Um, I had the opportunity to, to know him and to um, follow him some years later as Secretary of Transportation. And I was just so moved by the many expressions of, um, of love and respect for him. And uh, clearly that's, that's my feeling as well. Uh, but I must, if I may, um, 
uh, Cheryl Lynn, the last time we saw each other was in Arkansas. It was in Little Rock. And uh, you mentioned those early years you spent in the Delta region, uh, the region where I was born in Arkansas and raised uh, there. And uh, John Walker, uh, I just mentioned his name because uh, we were all together for his service. But uh, you had mentioned that you saw your first African-American lawyer in law school. And John was the first that I saw uh, an African-American lawyer. And he was actually representing uh, a few of my colleagues and me. Uh, we had boycotted the school uh, there in my hometown of Mariana uh, because of, um, frankly, being denied the opportunity to, uh, to honor Dr. King with a program in his honor. And I, I just I thought of him when you mentioned uh, the Delta and you mentioned Arkansas, and I just wanted to uh, to, to mention that. Uh, the question, a new administration, an opportunity for other individuals to have um, an occasion like Ted had, where he said, offered two opportunities to serve as a judge. Really across government, there are many, many opportunities for lawyers. Are there things that we could do to uh, promote lawyers at this time, and especially with uh, our new uh, vice president-elect, uh, uh, Kamala Harris, who happens to be a lawyer from the historic, um, uh, an undergraduate uh, student from the historic Howard uh, University. And so are there things that we might consider, either, any of you uh, responding to this, uh, as we look to the new administration, its relationship to the business community, and an opportunity to shape policy? Thoughts on that? Yeah, I well, I'll um, start. Go ahead, okay. Sharon, please. No, no, I just we take this very seriously. We have been, um, you know, thinking about this for some time. It's a difficult moment, almost in the way that Ted described. You, you know, you're going to lose some of your people, and you hope you're going to lose some of your people. We have been through a very difficult four years. Uh, I have said that, you know, if uh, the election turned out the way it did turn out, that this will be like 1944, 45, and it's rebuilding time uh, amidst the rubble. And much of um, our government functions have to be built back. I think about, you know, the Department of Justice uh, and what has happened there and how critical the Department of Justice is to civil rights enforcement. Uh, the, the, the department is supposed to be the, the premier uh, civil rights enforcement organization. Um, and I could, you know, no matter how many law firms we partner with, LDF could never reach the capacity that the Department of, the Just, of Justice theoretically has to do civil rights enforcement. And yet, for four years, it has basically gone dark on civil rights. And so that division and the department itself needs to be resuscitated. And that means having strong lawyers who have a civil rights vision who are in that space. And we recognize that and we understand uh, that that will happen. But it will also happen in the Department of Education and uh, in HUD. I think about the State Department and people who you know, want to be in the Foreign Service. And there are many, many uh, areas where I think it's vitally important that we be ready to, um, to to make the sacrifices that will be necessary to move people into place so that their voice can be heard. Um, you know, Secretary Slater, you talked about Bill Coleman, so important. Transportation is one of the issues that's vitally important for the African American community. And I've, you know, spoken often and litigated in the space of uh, uh, transportation discrimination, you know, highway siting and placement public transportation. These are infrastructure issues that often people are not recognizing have deep civil rights implications for uh, economic opportunity for members of our community. So all of the uh, areas of government are, are, are vitally important to the progress of our work. And yes, we should be, we should be submitting those names now. Uh, you should be reaching out to your contacts and, and indicating the, the individuals who you think are ready to serve and can make a contribution because this is an, a really important moment to do repair work, but also to, to try to advance civil rights, uh, you know, in this moment with the, with the imprimatur and resources and heft of the federal government. Ken, would you like to say a word? Well, Sherilyn covered most of what I was going to say, which is that I do think that the new administration will be looking for talent um, I think the old administration, the people who held those positions were often people who didn't believe in the mission of those organizations, the ones that she named, Department of Labor, you could add to that, EPA, you could add to that, 
I think this is an opportunity for us to bring forward uh, some of our best young talent to get them opportunities in the government to start to reshape the government's role uh, in terms of driving forward progress in this country. Thank you, Ken. Our next question is going to come from Catherine Lauderdale, who I'm delighted to see again. We haven't seen each other for several years. Uh, she was actually the first general counsel I ever met, the first black general counsel, and now she still is the general counsel at PBS, one of the most important uh, broadcast organizations in the world. So Catherine, please ask your question. Thank you, David. And the panel has really been inspiring today. Uh, despite a decade, more than a decade really, of work in diversity by the ABA, we have not made progress with diversity in the profession and with retention of African-American lawyers uh, in corporate law firms uh, and, and generally in, in corporate law. Uh, if you had a chance to create a priority list of action steps uh, to increase uh, retention of Blacks in uh, corporate law, what would be at the top of that list? The panel's mentioned so many things. All of you have talked about having mentors, uh, uh, but networking, role modeling, what, what would be at the top of your list for us to look at for uh, a strategic plan? Ted, I'm going to ask you as the hmm. person most expert on this. Look, I, I, I think you have to start at the general counsel level. Um, and you have to, if, if, I were, if I was the czar of the universe, I would require the board of the Fortune 1000 companies to require uh, that the general counsel report on an annual basis uh, about the amount of work that they are they have given out to African American lawyers, be they in African American firms or predominantly white firms uh, to African American partners in those firms, and really reveal the numbers. Who got the telephone call? because it's the relationship partner who gets the call and controls the client that gives that particular lawyer the opportunity to have influence in his or her law firm. But I can tell you uh, today, as a general rule, I continue to be the lone black lawyer in the room. When I go to court in some of these major cases, it is rare that I see another black lawyer in a senior speaking position. So the general counsel ought to have to report to the board about the actual dollar amount uh, that they've given out to African-American lawyers and how many of the company's major cases have been argued by African-American lawyers. How many of the corporation's major corporate transactions have been headed by African-American lawyers. And the GCs ought to have to report that to the board on an annual basis. And I think if that was required, I think we would finally see uh, some progress because what uh, continues to go on today, even though there's great talk about diversity, is at the end of the day, if you look at the actual dollars being spent, uh, they're infinitesimal. And if, if there was real progress being made, I would be able to look around and see a lot more African American lawyers in these major cases. And especially to get them on their feet, representing the company as the lead lawyer. This, uh, there's a lot of talk about diversity on the team, but very often if there is diversity, the African American lawyer is quite often the junior person on, on the team and rarely is the African-American lawyer the senior person. So you have to hold people accountable and you have to develop metrics by which you can measure accountability. And the only thing I'll add to that as somebody who studies this a lot for a living, uh, is that if you were to do that and you were to see this kind of success Ted is talking about, that would then inspire the next generation to think it was actually worth the candle to put in the effort to try to achieve 
that level of success in a major law firm. And the proof of the pudding is Ted, who has mentored and developed and brought along uh, many more black lawyers in his law firm than almost any other comparable law firm. And it's because they see the success. They see Ted at the top and Ted reaching down. Um, our next question uh, comes from uh, former U.S. Executive Director James Hudson. What is the panel and what do we see as the uh, new brown, uh, the question that would be faced by the African-American community as well as by its, uh, its lawyers? Uh, is, is that uh, this, this incarceration issue and, and particularly its impact upon uh, African-American males? If you look at the last uh, election, uh, Trump, I think it's a nexus here. Trump's, Trump received 20%, uh, approximately 20% or more of the African male vote. And I think there's a nexus between that and what's going on in lack of jobs, which uh, is a part of the incarceration issue. So is uh, incarceration uh, issue the new brown and what role would black lawyers play in uh, moving that issue forward? Uh, I'm honored to be here and I appreciate what the panel has done, uh, all of them, and, and thank Juliana for uh, having me a part of this. I do think this is the issue. I, I think that the biggest challenge facing the African-American community today is the lack of employment for young African-American men. And a big part of that problem stems from the large number of African-Americans who are A, incarcerated, B, and have no reasonable means of re-entry into society after they have served their time and, and paid their debt to society. I think this is a huge issue for us as a, as a community. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to get corporations to do is to be focused on hiring people based on skills, not based on their backgrounds, not based on their academic credentials, uh, because there's like a million African-Americans between the age of 22 and 35 who have a GED or a high school degree. So I would come back to saying that I, I believe that this is um, one of the most important issues that we can contest right now with the fact that, you know, as I've said, heard before from Brian Stevenson, it's a black child born today, male child has a one in three <coughs> chance of, uh, of being a part of the criminal justice system. And, and again, I'm focused on the re-entry of people back into society in a way that they can actually earn success. Yeah, you, what, what I would I would echo what, what Ken said, um, the issue of mass incarceration is one of the most important issues facing the black community. At the same time, an equally important issue is voting rights. And I believe the two are connected. Uh, I think what we see in the area of attempts to suppress the black vote uh, has the potential to set us back more than any other uh, thing that is going on. Because if we're not able to get our votes counted, uh, we are not going to be able to make the progress that will be necessary to deal with the mass incarceration issue or the deal with the issue of education and employment. Uh, to me, everything starts uh, with the right to vote in terms of a functioning democracy. And, then, and the fact that the Republican Party uh, is able uh, to engage in voter suppression efforts without any type of shame or any attempt to hide what is really going on is to me one of the most disturbing uh, issues I think uh, we face as African-Americans and that LDF faces. So I, so I believe there's a very tight connection between the right to vote and the ability to deal with the mass incarceration issue, the issue of employment and the issue of education and healthcare. Thank you. Our next question uh, comes from another leader in the profession for many years, Charlize Lilly, who's now the CEO of CRL Consulting and was one of the real leaders in the ABA's movement uh, around integrating the profession. So Charlize, it's wonderful to see you again. 
Wonderful to see you, David. Um, the question I have really um, focuses on the federal courts as has been reconstituted uh, in this administration. And I'm wondering how you all think civil rights litigation strategy is going to be changing in light of the fact that the next generation of federal judges are probably going to be very hostile to, the, to uh, such litigation. Well, Ted, you can give your answer, but I think the fact of the matter is you stated the problem very well, Sharice. Uh, this yeah. president has appointed over 200 members of the federal bench. Uh, and so we will have many roadblocks to the advancement of African-American rights through the courts. I think on the other hand, I think the reality of the world is we have the agency to work through the legislatures, uh, particularly the state legislatures, but also through Congress to use the legislation approach to things. But I think it's unfortunate. Uh, you got a bunch, of, I saw the other day that President Trump just appointed a 33 year old district court judge, uh, very conservative person. Uh, I think we can look forward to a Supreme Court uh, for quite a generation that will be out of step with what the average American thinks ought to be happening in this country. Yeah, I, look, look, I think part of the uh, response goes back to my comments about voting. Uh, there's no question that the Trump administration has been able to pack the federal courts in an unprecedented fashion uh, with people that have a conservative agenda. Now, the question is, will the Biden administration have an opportunity to even that out? If we do not win both of the seats, uh, in the Georgia runoff, uh, and the Senate remains under the control of the Republican Party, we will be in a position uh, where the Biden administration may be forced uh, to appoint federal judges uh, who are extremely moderate in order to get them confirmed. So it goes back again to voting and our ability of uh, uh, to take over the Senate if we want to try to put people on the federal bench who have um, a more progressive uh, uh, view of the law. So I, so I think, again, the voting is very important. Uh, but with that said, I, I, I will always believe that the role of LDF in, in the African-American uh, legal community uh, will be to take certain civil rights cases to the courts and try to develop a factual record at the trial level uh, that will permit advancement of, of, of civil rights. Uh, but, I, but I recognize regretfully that um, unless the composition of the US Supreme Court is changed that some of those wins may be threatened at the highest level. Uh, but nonetheless, we're somebody who for many years represented as general counsel in NAACP in New Jersey, where much of the work we did involved police brutality work. Uh, it is going to continue to be important that we have African-American lawyers willing to take on those cases and to litigate them at the trial level. I think the only thing I'll add is just uh, to go back to what Ken said about the private sector. Uh, like for most of our history, the courts were hostile to us. And so, uh, you know, in some ways, as I said, 1954 uh, to, I don't know, until the Burger Court was sort of a blip. And so we have to find multiple ways of pursuing the strategy. Our last question comes from the ultimate closer. And I think my friends will know exactly what I mean when I say his name. Uh, I'll just, I could just say the flash will speak, but just for those who might not know, he's a, uh, he's many things he's been, but most recently former of counsel at Morgan Lewis, but Fletcher Flash Wiley is known and loved by all of us and Flash, bring us home. Thank you, David. Uh, I wanted to make two comments. One, for the wonderful uh, and lustrous job you and your panel did in outlining the importance in history that the Black lawyer has made 
uh, in the history of this country. Uh, I would just like to point out one group uh, because we have been dealing at the very top with the very best of our profession. Uh, there's also uh, the black lawyer who has toiled throughout uh, African American history in our villages, in our hamlets, uh, in our churches, uh, and dealing with business problems, uh, family problems, and so forth, uh, who did not necessarily become judges or at the top level of the Black profession, but who became leaders of our community and helping to break uh, the, the strong arm of, uh, 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 that slavery has held on our people. So a tip of hat to those Black lawyers in the private practice as well. You know, you, when we talk about it, it takes a village. Uh, the Black legal profession is a big village uh, and everybody plays a different role. I mean, I tell all the young law students who I talk to, the first thing I tell them to do is to join their local Black Bar Association. Uh, because joining your local Black Bar Association at a young age is a way to develop contacts uh, with all members of the Black legal community in your particular city or state. And that if you grow up together, having started those contacts at a young age, you will be able to have that type of network uh, that will not be limited uh, just to big law and the judiciary, but to be involved in all aspects of the African-American community. And what Flash said is exactly right. Uh, the, the vast majority of African lawyer, of African American lawyers are are practicing uh, in small firms, and they are doing God's work in terms of dealing with the day to day problems uh, that people in the African American community face, uh, be it employment issues, or just buying a house, or trying to, trying to deal with with healthcare. So. Uh, Although this particular panel, uh, you know, involved uh, myself and, and Ken Frazier, uh, you know, I just want to endorse what, what Flash said and to recognize uh, how broad our community is and how we all work together and how it's important that we be viewed uh, collectively as one family. I'll just say amen. <laughs> And I'll just say that this brings us full circle because Charles Hamilton Houston's father was a black solo practitioner. Thurgood Marshall started his practice as a solo practitioner doing criminal defense work in Baltimore. And that when they became the leaders of the Legal Defense Fund, they always engaged local black lawyers around the country who played a pivotal role in uh, not just bringing civil rights cases, but in bringing legal services of all kinds uh, to our community, which has been chronically underserved. Uh, so as always, Flash brings us <coughs> home to an important idea. Uh, I, again, end where I began. I cannot thank this incredible panel enough for all that they've done to help us to shine a light on these issues. And I urge all of you, including you, Flash, to make sure that these stories are written down, that the papers are preserved. And so for future generations, we'll understand the incredible history uh, that has been made. Um, thank you all for being a part of this program. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you, history makers. And with that, I'll say good evening. Thank you. Thank you.